Hi, I'm Melissa from Story Family Farm, and welcome back to the Bible in a Year readings. We are at March 23rd, and that is going to come from Deuteronomy 25 through 26, Ecclesiastes 2, 18 through 26, and Luke 23. So Deuteronomy 25. Suppose two people take a dispute to court, and the judges declare that one is right and the other is wrong. If the person in the wrong is sentenced to be flogged, the judge will command him to lie down and be beaten in his presence with the number of lashes appropriate to the crime. No more than 40 lashes may ever be given. More than 40 lashes would publicly humiliate your neighbor. Do not keep an ox from eating as it treads out the grain. If two brothers are living together on the same property and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Instead, her husband's brother must marry her and fulfill the duties of a brother-in-law. The first son she bears to him will be counted as the son of the dead brother, so that his name will not be forgotten in Israel. But if the dead man's brother refuses to marry the widow, she must go to the town gate and say to the leaders there, My husband's brother refuses to preserve his brother's name in Israel. He refuses to marry me. The leaders of the town will then summon him and try to reason with him. If he still insists that he doesn't want to marry her, the widow must walk over to him in the presence of the leaders, pull his sandal from his foot, and spit in his face. She will then say, This is what happens to a man who refuses to raise up a son for his brother. He, ever afterward, his family will be referred to as the family of the man whose sandal was pulled off. If two Israelite men are fighting and the wife of one tries to rescue her husband by grabbing the testicle of the other man, her hand must be cut off without pity. You must use accurate scales when you weigh out merchandise, and you must use full and honest measures. Yes, use honest weights and measures so that you will enjoy a long life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Those who cheat with dishonest weights and measures are detestable to the Lord your God. Never forget what the Amicalites did to you as you came from Egypt. They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary, and they struck down those who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies in the land he has given you as a special possession, you are to destroy the Amicalites and erase their memory from under heaven. Never forget this. Chapter 26. Harvest Offerings and Tithes when you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession, and you have conquered it and settled there, put some of the first produce from each harvest into a basket, and bring it to the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Go to the priest in charge of that time and say to him, With this gift I acknowledge that the Lord your God has brought me to the land he swore to give our ancestors. The priest will then take the basket from your hand and set it before the altar of the Lord your God. You must then say in the presence of the Lord your God, May My ancestor Jacob was a wandering... Aramean, who went to live in Egypt. His family was few in number, but in Egypt they became a mighty and numerous nation. When the Egyptians mistreated and humiliated us by making us their slaves, we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. He heard us and saw our hardship, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with amazing power, overwhelming terror, and miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land flowing with milk and honey. And now, O Lord, I have brought you a token of the first crops you have given me from the ground. Then place the produce before the Lord your God and worship him. Afterward, go and celebrate because all of the good things the Lord your God has given to you in your household. Remember to include the Levites and the foreigners living among you in the celebration. Every third year, you must offer a special tithe of your crops. You must give these tithes to the Levites, foreigners, orphans, and widows so that they will have enough to eat in, the, in your towns. Then you must declare in the presence of the Lord your God, I have taken the sacred gift from my house and have given it to the Levites, foreigners, orphans, and widows, just as you commanded me. I have not violated or forgotten any of your commands. I have not eaten any of it while in the morning. I have not while well in mourning. I have not touched it while I was ceremonially unclean, and I have not offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God, and I have done everything you commanded me. Look down from your holy dwelling place in heaven and bless your people, Israel. And the land you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey, just as you solemnly promised our ancestors. A call to obey the Lord's commands. Today the Lord your God has commanded you to obey all these laws and regulations. You must commit yourself to them without reservation. You have declared today that the Lord is your God. You have promised to obey his laws, commands, and regulations by walking in his ways and doing everything he tells you. The Lord has declared today that you are his people, his own special treasure, just as he promised, and that you must obey all his commands. And if you do, he will make you greater than any other nation. 
Then you will receive praise, honor, and renown. You will be a nation that is holy to the Lord your God, just as he promised. And then Ecclesiastes 2... 18 through 26. So this is Ecclesiastes, which was written by a son of David. I believe it's Solomon, because he was very wise. Okay. So, 18 through 26. I am disgusted that I must leave the fruits of my hard work to others. And who can tell whether my successors will be wise or foolish? And yet they will control everything I have gained by my skill and hard work. How meaningless. So I turned in despair from hard work. It was not the answer to my search for satisfaction in this life. For though I do my work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, I must leave everything I gain to people who haven't worked to earn it. This is not only foolish, but highly unfair. So what do people get for all their hard work? Their days, are labor, their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night they cannot rest. It is all utterly meaningless. So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that this pleasure is from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him? God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy to those who please him. But if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please him. Even this, however, is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Luke chapter 23. Jesus' trial before Pilate. Then the entire council took Jesus over to Pilate, the Roman governor. They began at once to state their case. This man has been leading our people to ruin by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Yes, it is as you say. Pilate turned to the leading priests and to the crowd and said, I find nothing wrong with this man. Then they became desperate. But he is causing riots everywhere he goes, all over Judea, from Galilee to Jerusalem. Oh, is he a Galilean? Pilate asked. When they answered that he was, Pilate sent him to Herod Antipas, because Galilee was under Herod's jurisdiction. And Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus because he had heard about him and had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. He asked Jesus question after question, but Jesus refused to answer. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law stood there shouting their accusations. Now Herod and his soldiers began mocking and ridiculing Jesus. Then they put a royal robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate, who had been enemies before, became friends that day. Then Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people, and he announced his verdict. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence, and I find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty. So I will have him flogged, but then I will release him. Then a mighty roar rose from the crowd, and with one voice they shouted, Kill him and release Barabbas to us! Barabbas was in prison for murder and for taking part in an insurrection in Jerusalem against the government. Pilate argued with them because he wanted to release Jesus, but they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he demanded, Why? What crime has he committed? I have found no reason to sentence him to death. I will therefore flog him and let him go. But the crowd shouted louder and louder for Jesus' death, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate sentenced Jesus to death, to die, as they commanded as they'd requested, he released Barabbas. Barabbas. The man in prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Jesus over to them to do as they wished. The crucifixion. As they led Jesus away, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country just then, was forced to follow Jesus and carry his cross. Great crowds trailed along behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains to fall on them and the hills to bury them. For if these things are done, when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? 
Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. Finally, they came to a place called the Skull. All three were crucified there, Jesus on the center cross and the two criminals on either side. Jesus said, Father, forgive these people because they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched and the leaders laughed and scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he really is God's chosen one, the Messiah. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself! A sign board was nailed to the cross above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you are dying? We deserve to die for our evil deeds, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. The death of Jesus. By this time it was noon and the dark and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone and suddenly the thick veil hanging in the temple was torn apart. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the captain of the Roman soldiers handling the execution saw what had happened, he praised God and said, Surely this man was innocent. And when the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw all that had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. The Burial of Jesus Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish High Council, but he had not agreed with the decisions and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he had been waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation for the Sabbath. As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where they placed his body. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to embalm him. But by the time they were finished, it was the Sabbath, so they rested all that day as required by the law. That is all for today's reading. I will see you next time.